bearing witness, seeking justice. Videography in the hands of the people. As you all know, from the murder of George Floyd to the recent protests in Iran, videography in the hands of the people can play a key role in protecting our rights and our civil liberties. At MIT, we want to make the world a better place. But if you want to make the world a better place, you need to understand how it works. The new ways in which videography is being used by the people provide unprecedented data about the workings of the society we live in. But these data won't deepen our understanding of society on their own. We need the tools of the humanities and the social sciences to interpret the data with rigor, with perspective, and with empathy. I hope that this conference will contribute to that investigation. I'd like to thank our speakers. Uh, I'd like to thank students visiting from the Hartford School District who will provide their unique viewpoints as they facilitate workshops. I'd like to thank the conference's steering committee and everyone who helped organize this event. It was a big job. And most of all, I would like to thank Professor Ken Manning, who came up with the vision for this conference and who pushed very, very hard to make sure that it happened. Thank you, Ken. And now, just as she walks in, uh, <laughs> it's my pleasure to hand the microphone to Shas, Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Tracy Jones. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> so I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Heather Hendershot. She studies TV news, conservative media, political movements, and American film and television history. She has held fellowships at Vassar College, New York University, Princeton, Harvard, Radcliffe, and Stanford. And she has also been a Guggenheim Fellow. Her courses at MIT emphasize the interplay between creative, political, and regulatory concerns, and how those concerns affect what we see on the screen, big or little. I have to take a deep breath. <laughs> Students in her class are encouraged to consider the ways that TV and film writers, directors, and producers have attempted innovation while working within an industry that demands novelty, but also often fears new approaches to character and narrative. Professor, Professor Hendershot is the editor of Nickelodeon Nation, the history, politics, and economics of America's only TV channel for kids, and the author of Saturday Morning Censors, Television Regulation Before the V-Chip, Shaking the World for Jesus, Media and Conservative Evangelical Culture, What's Fair on the Air, Cold World Right-Wing Broadcasting, and the Public Interest, and open to debate how William F. Buckley put liberal America on the firing line. For five years, she was the editor of Cinema Journal, the official publication of the Society for Cinema and Media Studies. Her latest book, When the News Broke, Chicago 1968, and the Polarizing of America is forthcoming from the University of Chicago Press this fall. Now I'd like to welcome Professor Heather Hindershot to the stage. All right. Thank you for that introduction. And there we go. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really honored to be the uh, opening plenary speaker for the conference. Uh, and to spending the next day or two with you. Um, as a media historian, 
Uh, my objective is always to tell stories about the past, go to archives, find new information about the past, find new ways of understanding what happened, but also to think about how those stories about the past can help us think through various issues in the present. Um, and so that is uh, part of what I'm going to be doing today in uh, telling you about material from my book, When the News Broke, that Tracy just mentioned, um, which is a book about Chicago in 1968 in August during the Democratic National Convention. Um, it is a story of authoritarianism, of police brutality, and uh, for our purposes, for thinking about uh, issues of media and technology, it's a story of top-down media production to a large extent. Uh, that is to say, uh, uh, media produced by uh, companies or like ACBS and NBC or by, you know, sort of uh, legitimately authorized kinds of journalists uh, from magazines and newspapers and to a lesser extent from some underground newspapers, some smaller uh, uh, sort of countercultural productions. Um, it is also a story about media production circumscribed by a number of concrete technological limitations. Uh, and I'm going to go into a number of those throughout my presentation over the next 45 minutes. Um, and it's also a story with, with repercussions, with fallout, with um, you know, following this convention, the notion of liberal media bias um, uh, that we hear bandied about uh, sort of took root in American culture. It had been seen as a kind of peripheral extremist notion, the idea that the media was liberal, uh, that CBS and NBC were liberal, because they were seen as very, very neutral kind of players. And, you know, this idea that the, the media has liberal biases is, is almost quaint now uh, in the light of accusations of fake news and enemy of the people sort of talk and the kind of polarization that we're seeing. So we're going back to a sort of primordial moment that in some ways helps us understand how we got from there to here, to where we are right now. Um, so as I said, I'm drawing uh, from this book that's coming out in December. Um, let me start by sort of setting the scene. Okay, so the book looks at four days in Chicago and the aftermath of those four days when the Democrats gathered to choose their next candidate for president and vice president. And Lyndon Baines Johnson, the president, had declined to run again, and it was assumed that the candidate would be his vice president, Huber Humphrey, but thousands of delegates came in and uh, uh, many of them hoped that there would be a different candidate or that at least if it were Hubert Humphrey, the vice president, that he would have a tempered uh, platform on Vietnam. He would have a different approach to Vietnam. Okay, so that's the basics. The bigger story uh, to help us understand going into Chicago is the scene in America at the time, uh, that we're in a kind of tinderbox situation. Uh, it's clear that we are not just about to win the war in Vietnam, which is what the government had been telling people for um, a couple of years. There had been a number of uh, high-profile assassinations. Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated in June, which uh, uh, was shocking, and he was expected to be a strong contender to be the, the nominee for president. He would have had a peace platform. Uh, Martin Luther King is assassinated. Um, in April, and there's a number of urban uprisings all over the country following the assassination of King, and of course that had been going back to earlier in the 60s, starting with the famous Watts uprising of 1965, and this is the smallest list of cities where, where these uh, uprisings happened, D.C., Newark, Detroit, famously in 1967, was basically on fire uh, for an entire week. Um, and then Chicago had uh, an uprising following the death of King. And, uh, you know, th there, were, there was a great deal of shooting in the street, and the vast majority of people uh, killed by police were people of color. Right before the Democratic Convention in Chicago, a week or two before, um, there had been a Republican National Convention, where they nominated Nixon, uh, in Miami. And there was an uprising there about a mile away from the conference. And the uh, sheriff of Miami famously said, uh, when this happened, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And famously, I say, because it had some traction at the time, but then, of course, more recently, we heard the, the former president use exactly these words at a certain moment during the Black Lives Matters protest following the murder of George Floyd. So it's a, a phrasing that has a great deal of resonance. So it's a powder keg situation. 
Um, there are obviously some comparisons we can make between then and now, an ongoing crisis of police brutality, particularly targeting people of color. There was a crisis of leadership then in 68, and because uh, everything went so badly in Chicago, that really helped Richard Nixon uh, get elected to uh, fulfill his promise to restore law and order, another phrasing that the former president uh, was fond of using. A sort of dog whistle to Nixon for putting down people of color and various other uh, progressive social justice movements in the US. Um, okay. So that sets you up for just America in 1968 uh, very briefly. Uh, the other thing to think about heading into Chicago is what I call a sort of infrastructure of censorship. Uh, there are a lot of uh, technological limitations that the mayor of Chicago, Mayor Richard Daley, had put into place. And it's, it's pretty detailed. I won't go into all of them. But a key one is that there was an electrical worker strike that uh, basically prevented live coverage of the convention outside the convention hall. And it was standard for network news people to leave the convention and go to the hotels where the candidates were and to interview them. But also, at this particular convention, there were 10,000 protesters in the streets. There was a story to be told in the streets, and that was very, very hard to do because of this electrical worker strike. Uh, and Mayor Daley uh, was a very... Um, authoritarian mayor, he had the unions kind of under his thumb, and it was very telling that this was the one strike that he couldn't settle. Uh, this was not someone who, who often dealt with the problem of strikers because the unions were sort of in his back pocket and he had a lot of patronage jobs and so on. So it's no coincidence that the strike was not resolved at this moment. Um, there are also technological limitations that uh, create were part of this infrastructure of censorship, as I call it. Uh, the limitations of, of news and, and image gathering, such as the camera weights and sizes and so on. I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. I'm going to try to wait, stay away from all these text heavy slides because it can be boring. You're like, oh, she's saying the same thing that I'm reading up there. So I'm going to try to stick to lots of pictures to kind of keep, um, keep you awake, keep going. Um, and finally, I'll say that uh, part of this infrastructure uh, of censorship was that mainstream journalism had certain professional norms of, of fairness, what we now call both sidesism, right? That, that would be anachronistic to apply then. Um, but with only NBC, CBS, and ABC doing the news, and NBC and CBS doing the majority of the news in Chicago, um, there was a sense that they should be very neutral, they should be fair to everyone, and that often meant undercovering uh, the mistakes that Mayor Daley was making, undercovering the police brutality, so that they would not appear to be being unfair to the city of Chicago and to Mayor Daley himself. Now, I mentioned the electrical worker strike, which the, the, the fallout from that in the main was that for this convention, you needed thousands, not hundreds, thousands of extra telephone lines uh, installed. And since we have a range of age groups in the room, I'll just say like, telephones had wires that went into the wall. <laughs> and if you had a major political event, like a convention, you had to install lots of extra telephones. Why? Well, first of all, reporters needed telephones to phone in their stories. And so this is a picture actually from the New York Public Library that I found that I thought was very uh, kind of beautiful. Uh, but this, would also, this could be any hotel in America in some ways in the 1950s or 1960s. A wall of wooden telephone booths, and if a major news event happened, every one of them would be filled by a reporter on the phone uh, telling, calling in their story to their newspaper. So in addition to your phone booths, you needed extra lines installed throughout town because there's you know, hundreds of thousands of, ex or many, many thousands extra people in town. The networks needed these extra lines to broadcast live outside the convention hall, as I've said. They couldn't set up their trucks outside in the street because they didn't have the electrical lines. And when they found some electrical lines, they were mysteriously cut. <laughs> uh, and that just sort of kept happening. Um, so there was obviously a little bit of uh, sabotage going on. The delegates themselves, the thousands of people inside the convention hall, needed extra telephone lines installed so they could talk to each other because they didn't have phones in their pockets. And so how were they going to uh, talk about, you know, here's how we can come up with a new Vietnam War platform. Here's how we can, whatever kind of hobnobbing they need to do was seriously stymied by this extreme lack of telephones, okay? So that just gives you a basic idea of how important the telephone issue really was. So coming into Chicago, the assassinations, the crisis of America, the Richard Nixon nomination, and all these things would be on your mind if, say, you're a journalist driving into town. 
And as you come into town, you would, as you were taking a cab down the streets, you would see temporary walls that had been put up in front of vacant lots. They wanted to cover up any spots that, you know, there were broken glass or like, you know, signs of poverty, they tried to hide those. They installed new flowers everywhere. I mean, the roots hadn't even taken root. They pulled them out of pots and just put them around to make it look like there are lots of flowers in Chicago. And in addition to that, you've got welcome signs for Mayor Daley everywhere. Hello, Democrats, welcome to Chicago. And it wasn't really an option if you didn't feel like putting in your window because they would be like, oh, we'll send the health inspector over right away to make sure, and then you were shut down. So you just said yes, you took the signs in your window. Um, then let's say you're this hypothetical journalist, you get to your hotel, you want to call your boss and say you've arrived, you're ready to get to work. The picture of Mayor Daley is on a sticker in the cradle of the phone, right? Welcome to the International Democratic Convention. Again, his face, and then you pick it up and you're like, oh, I can't get a line, right? So it sort of added insult to injury to see his face as you couldn't get through because there aren't enough electrical lines because of the electrical worker strike. So, that gives you a more sense of the, the scene on the ground for, for journalists arriving in town. And then there are these technological issues that I referenced earlier. Um, cameras, and this is actually an image from 1964 uh, from the convention um, in the Republican convention, but it looked very similar to the sorts of cameras you'd see on the floor in 1968. You've got this thing on your back if you're a cameraman and there were not camera women at the time. Um, that weighs almost 100 pounds, and then he's holding up this camera in front of him as well. Then he'd have a cable coming out going to a sound man, again, all men. Um, or sometimes the cable would actually go to the reporter. They would have to skip the sound man and just, you know, the, the reporter would be reporting and also doing, working his own sound system. So it's not a very portable system. This is technically a portable system because of this giant plastic harness <laughs> that you can use so you don't theoretically fall down when you put this giant thing on and you walk around the convention hall. Um, so these kinds of things would already be a bit, a bit awkward in the street, but of course they were impossible because of the electrical issues. Another option would be Oh, what about a 16 millimeter camera, which weighs only 20 to 30 pounds, depending on if it's got a battery in it or whether it's hand cranked, right, which would make it lighter can hoist it on your shoulder. Um, the issue there, um, again, for some of the younger people in the room, is that you had to develop film. <laughs> so you shoot this film in the street, and then you have to rush it back to the convention center on motorcycles. Um, and they have trailers set up there where you can develop the film in the trailers, and then they have technicians there, uh, the networks, you know, to edit it and to get it on the air. So it's not the most um, efficient sort of system. It's possible, but it's extra hard because you need to turn on lights if it's at night, for example, to shoot. So you have these handheld large sort of lights, you turn them on, and then the police immediately go, aha, I see that light, I see there's a journalist, and they take a nightstick and they break the light and then they probably break the camera as well. So uh, journalists are being targeted and just having a light so that you can shoot with your camera is a sort of bullseye on your back. So 16 millimeter was, was not a great option. That said, there is some uh, 16 millimeter footage from the convention uh, that, has, uh, that, that, that remains that we still study now and we watch today. Um, another issue going into Chicago, and I already mentioned this, the sort of perceived trustworthiness of, of the networks and the perceived neutrality of the networks. Um, you've got Walter Cronkite as the main anchorman for, uh, for CBS, and he's regularly rated in surveys as the most trusted man in America until the convention where everything goes to hell in a handbasket. Um, you also have NBC's Huntley and Brinkley, who are likewise seen as fairly neutral. Perhaps in their private life, they tend to vote one way or another, and that might come through in a New Yorker magazine profile, but the public perception is that they are doing their, new, their, their jobs in a very sort of neutral manner. Okay, so I mentioned how, you know, if you turn on a light, the bulb would get busted out. Um, the big picture here was that journalists, and I'm about to show uh, 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 some uh, violent content, I'll just give you a warning. Um, journalists were being targeted in the street. And this is an image uh, of an NBC News um, journalist with a freelance photographer, and you see their heads are, are, are bloody because they've been uh, beaten by, um, with nightsticks. Um, and one thing that's fascinating here is that if you read uh, like interviews with journalists of the time who had covered Detroit, 
or Washington, D.C., or Newark, or other cities that had, had uprisings where the people were in the street and there was uh, looting and arson and police were shooting. Journalists generally felt that the police kind of had their back that they were there as a neutral person trying to do their job. They knew they were in danger. They were in the street in the middle of all of this conflagration and so on, and they knew that they could be harmed, but it was just part of their job. But they felt that the police had their back. The police would actually say, get out of the way, you know, we're gonna, whatever. They would sort of help them out in certain ways. Chicago was really different. This is the first time when journalists are saying, uh, 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 you know, we are actually the prime target for attack. And of course, another exception there was the coverage of civil rights in the South, where journalists were, often, were quite often targeted. So, so there's that as well. Um, but the, the, the level of targeting of journalists was really sort of over the top. This is a very famous image of a Chicago photojournalist, Paul Sequeira. Uh, he's capturing a shot of himself being maced for being a photojournalist, and he's actually held the camera up to his face to try to keep the mace out of his face and taken a shot as the mace kind of comes toward him. And I say this is famous. This is one of the images from Chicago that's been reproduced quite a bit over the years, um, and it, you know, if it were today, it would be in color, but I feel like it resonates quite strongly today. We've seen a lot of images of police um, harming people over the past few years, and um, that the, the smiling is, of course, one of the most uh, terrifying things here, this sort of sense of enjoying what, what they're doing, and that is not uncommon in these images from Chicago. It's very uh, uh, alarming. Um, another famous image is of this New York Times photographer, Barton Silverman, being beaten for being a New York Times uh, photographer. And one thing that's typical about this image is how overwhelmed he is by so many people. <laughs> that, that, you know, 10 cops to one person. And in Chicago, there are 10,000 protesters who are protesting the convention itself, protesting the war. Um, there are 100,000 people working security. It's 10 to 1. So that includes um, the entire Chicago police force, the National Guard, uh, Secret Service, private uh, security agencies. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the sort of overkill here is, is quite extreme. Um, in addition to targeting protesters or, you know, hippies or some kind of uh, people derided as long hairs, as it were at the time, uh, just regular citizens in the street. If you were in downtown Chicago, uh, you were probably going to be in trouble during those four days in August. And this is a lesser known image. And one thing I've tried to do in my research on this is kind of retrieve images that haven't entered our mythical archive of the images of Chicago. This is a, a UPI a news service image of a woman fleeing on her bicycle and her child has been tear gassed. And there are reports of, of you know, people just driving through downtown on a motorcycle, they get hit with a, uh, 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 hit by a police officer, or they have the window down in their car and they get maced through the window. So it was a kind of uh, indiscriminate attack on anyone who just happened to be out uh, in public. The mo one of the most famous images of Chicago is this one in front of the Chicago Hilton Hotel. So this is from what came to be known as the Battle of Michigan Avenue on the third day of the convention. And uh, this, these images from this, I've put it in quotation marks, police riot, I'll explain what that means in a moment, they fill TV viewers with anger, and specifically anger against the network news, which was seen as uh, at fault for showing these images of police brutality um, and for showing bias against the Chicago police by showing what they did, by reporting what they did. Um, I put police riot in quotation marks because I'm actually referring to a famous statement from the Walker Report, which was the name of the government study that was commissioned right after the convention. And speaking of bias, one thing that's so fascinating about the Walker Report is that the creators of that report um, you know, commissioned by the government, tell us what happened. And they had to do this report in large part because people were so angry and assumed that the networks had just somehow made up this story, that it really wasn't that bad or, or whatever. The protesters deserved it because they provoked the police and they deserved to be beaten. This was the common line. So the government uh, funds this report and the people creating the report go into it. You read interviews with them later. 
really with a very strong bias toward the police. They assume that what they're going to find is that the news really did misreport this, that people were very provocative of police and, and sort of were asking for it and ultimately deserved to be beaten. And as they triple triple check their facts, they found that that was not the case, that this really had been what they described as a police riot, that it was that that protesters certainly had engaged in some uh, activities that were, you know, like hurling obscenities at police, hurling objects at them sometimes. It's not that they didn't do anything to defend themselves, but the police really were at fault. Um, against everything they felt going into the study, these were the results that they came up with. Um, in the name of bringing in a few other images outside of our mythical archive of Chicago images that get recycled in, say, Ken Burns documentaries or PBS documentaries, whatever, um, I thought I'd show you just a couple more from the Battle of Michigan Avenue uh, in the uh, McCarthy headquarters. One of the candidates had headquarters in the hotel, and they brought people inside and set up a sort of emergency field hospital, and they tore up the bed sheets and put them on people's heads, uh, mostly heads. That's where a huge amount of the injuries were. Um, and NBC had hired a war photographer, David Douglas Duncan, to do freelance work for him, for them, uh, which is fascinating. This fellow has just come back from, from the Tet Offensive, right, <laughs> from doing this combat footage, and then he finds himself doing combat footage um, in the U.S. Um, another image that I find quite striking is uh, from that same night is this room where everyone's being treated and cared for, and they're watching TV, and in effect, they're watching TV of what happened to them, because it's not live, because it takes three hours after this battle happens, over three hours, for it to actually show up on TV. So it ends up being around midnight when, when American viewers and the people who've been beaten see what happened on television. So after all of this, a survey uh, two months later by the University of Michigan um, asked respondents if they had heard about the police and demonstrators in Chicago and what they thought about the level of police violence. So there was a general sense in the culture that uh, uh, you know, people were angry and et, et cetera, but how could you gauge this? So they tried to crunch some numbers on this. And what they found was that 12% had not heard what was going on, uh, which is kind of amazing because these are images that in contemporary parlance you know, went viral. <laughs> They wouldn't say that then. But they were not only on late at night when they finally got to the convention hall, but they were uh, still photos were in newspapers, they were in magazines, they were uh, the images, the moving images were repeated on the, on the television news throughout the country for days afterwards. Uh, it was hard not to see these images. But 12 people, 12% 12 of the people uh, surveyed said they, had, they weren't aware. 12% didn't know what they thought about it. 18% of American surveyed felt that too much force had been used in Chicago. 23, uh, sorry, 32% thought it was the right amount of force, and 25% felt that it was not enough force. Um, so that is, you know, 57% of people who are uh, uh, pro-police coming out of this. Um, which is, it's, it's, it's amazing, it's a very high number. Um, and at this point, I'll just add for, for a few more numbers, um, the American population is about 88% uh, white identified Americans. Uh, so this is seen as like a survey of, of white attitudes um, at the time. And I'll also add that the Democratic National Convention was the single highest rated program in all of 1968. So just to give you a sense of how many people were actually watching this, not just the people who saw the aftermath of the images. Okay, so what are a few takeaways at this point? Well, a majority of Americans sided with the police in Chicago against protesters, hippies, and yippies, and by extension against the media. Most felt that TV overreported police brutality, didn't provide enough context um, that showed why police uh, protesters deserved uh, the treatment they got. Um, and the reality, uh, from my own research findings, is that the media underreported police violence in Chicago out of this sense of fairness and the, the, the professional norms that I cited earlier. 5% um, of the coverage, uh, okay, 95% of NBC's coverage and CBS's coverage was inside the convention hall, and 3 to 5% was in the streets. So the amount of violence they showed was actually pretty small, right, uh, percentage-wise, and yet people felt that the news had shown too much 
Um, what's fascinating to me when I think about this in comparison to today and these reactions is, and I'm, I'm not sure anyone uh, live streaming this can see my hands, but I'm holding my hands up to my face. <laughs> Let's say that I'm holding a camera and I'm filming this room right now like this. Okay, so the critique at the time was, well, you, you showed this, but you didn't pivot left or right, right? So you didn't show the whole room. And if you had taken more footage and edited it to, together better, you could have told a better story. All right, you just did a bad job. You didn't get the right images. You didn't tell the right story. We know that stories are created. They're not just found. They're not just neutrally out in the world, but they have to be created and put together. And that's a very different argument than someone saying, okay, you put your camera here, and what you showed me was fake. It simply didn't happen. Um, now, there's, uh, th you know, that there's, there's all kinds of ways to explain that. I mean, in a sense, it's a kind of ontological shift in, you know, how you perceive picture telling in reality. And of course, today we have deep fakes and we have imagery that can be much more literally fake than what you could see in 1968. But obviously, it also speaks to a new level of authoritarianism and what President Biden recently called semi-fascism or what one might simply call fascism uh, in terms of, of attitudes about the news, among other things. Um, I talked about the, the findings from that University of Michigan study, which are rather famous, but there are less often cited findings from that same study uh, about attitudes of black respondents, which at this point are about 10% of the US population. Uh, in the entire uh, pool of black respondents overall, 63% said that police use too much force. For blacks under 50, uh, the, the percentage was 78% of people who felt that police use too much force. And for blacks with at least some college education, police use too much force 82% of the time. So obviously we see a very big difference here. Um, overwhelmingly in both the alternative black press and in mainstream print and electronic sources, when I say alternative I mean like there's magazines like uh, Jet and Ebony and then there's black newspapers. Um, the uh, Amsterdam News, the Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier. So these black newspapers as well are part of that alternative uh, black media. Uh, but also in the mainstream media, New York Times, et cetera, one hears black Americans saying uh, that Chicago demonstrated, or at least should have demonstrated to the white majority, the reality of police brutality that blacks face every day. And heading into Chicago, uh, uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson predicted, is speaking to some organizers, he said, you know, it looks very likely people are gonna be beaten in Chicago because Mayor Daley is saying as much before the convention even starts. And he predicted that this could be helpful for the movement because it would bring home the reality of what police brutality was like for white middle class Americans for the so-called uh, silent majority. Um, I, I, and of course, you know, that, that didn't happen. I do think that this white on white violence, and this is this part of the, the findings of, of my research on this, um, was a kind of tipping point for Americans. And there's a kind of incoherence here because on the one hand, a lot of viewers of, you know, white middle class viewers seeing this on TV, they already have very negative attitudes about hippies and yippies, about war protesters, you know, long hairs. Um, have you ever seen a Dragnet episode from 1967, the kind of uh, right wing hostility towards anyone with long hair or a beard who looked different, who didn't shower enough, these kinds of complaints and, and sort of the disgust in the culture was, was pretty widespread. So on the one hand, you have people sort of cheering on the police, but on the other hand, you have people who have grown tragically sort of used to seeing uh, uh, white on black violence in the course of, of Watts and Detroit and, and other uprisings throughout the country. And the white on white violence is a kind of tipping point for them sort of feeling like, wow, now things have really sort of gone over the edge. Now America has reached a crisis point and you know, can we, what can we do to fix it? How can, what, what is our way forward? And uh, unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, the, the result, the, the answer to that question, what can we possibly do, was the election of Richard Nixon. That's sort of how this played out. Um, I argue that the network news didn't fail viewers by exhibiting a so-called liberal bias towards the Chicago police, but they did fail viewers in certain ways. And now I want to take just a few minutes to move inside the convention hall. Most of the historical traction around Chicago has been outside in the streets. But if we move inside the convention hall, um, we found that 
in addition to undercovering uh, violence in the name of fairness and so on in the streets, as I already mentioned, they also avoided a sort of deep contextualization that would help viewers get past the horse race elements of the nomination process. And this is probably true of a lot of conventions. So you get there, and it's just like who's ahead, who's behind, what are the votes, what are the numbers, and those are sort of the professional norms. But what that meant was they were missing out on the social justice, social justice issues that were in play in the convention hall. Um, where you had challenging delegates from so many states, uh, from uh, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, North Carolina, Texas, Mississippi, virtually all the southern states, delegates showed up saying, the delegates that, you, that the, the official delegates brought in were not properly elected. We weren't allowed to vote on these delegates. There's voter suppression in play, and we would like to be seated instead of, say, the delegates that, that came in from Mississippi. And in Mississippi, um, they won, and the other delegations uh, lost uh, in different ways. It's very complicated procedural stuff, and that's, I think, why the network's undercovered it in part, is it's really hard to explain um, all the ins and outs and, and the, the Roberts Rules of Orders that were in play. Um, but they, they ultimately said as procedural stuff, and they didn't really get into the social justice issues that were happening. So I feel like that was a failure of the news in Chicago. Um, they did cover some aspects of the crisis in the convention hall. Uh, this is a photo of the, uh, some of the pro-peace uh, delegates in the convention hall holding up these stop the war signs, which if you look closely, you can see the fold lines and the signs, and that these are uh, in, these protest signs were, paint, were printed overnight, secretly, on pages of the Chicago Tribune. Um, they didn't arrive in Chicago with a, a nice paper order they'd put in place with a contract with a printing company. It was all very seat of the pants once they realized they wouldn't be allowed to bring in their protest materials. So they had to print these overnights, fold them up, and hide them in their clothing to bring them in because you were only allowed to come in with Hubert Humphrey material and material that supported the Lyndon Maines Johnson sort of line on the war. So you had to sneak in the um, uh, anti-war uh, signs that you wanted to put. And people brought in bed sheets. They stole bed sheets from the hotel and they painted Stop the War on the bed sheets. They put, hid things in their hats because the women wore these giant hats and they pulled them out of their hats. I mean, it was really very inventive. Um, and the media covered that pretty well. It was a good story. It was an entertaining story in many ways. Um, they also covered violence against themselves. Uh, uh, Dan Rather was famously slugged by Daly's thugs, which I've put in quotation marks, not because they weren't thugs, but I'm quoting Walter Cronkite, who sort of lost his cool when Daly was, was or when uh, Dan Rather was punched and fell to the ground. Less often remembered is that Mike Wallace also got caught up in a tussle and, and punched to the ground. And after that, he was actually arrested, taken out of the, uh, the convention hall. Um, uh, in terms of uh, delegate protests, uh, we did see a reasonable amount of coverage of Julian Bond, who was protesting the Georgia delegation uh, that had been selected by Governor Lester Maddox, one of the most famous segregationists in America, sort of uh, just up there with, with George Wallace. Um, another key moment inside the convention hall that the, conven that the um, uh, networks undercovered was Fannie Lou Hamer's appearance speaking for the Alabama uh, challenging delegates. So she had been a key player in 1964. She's back in 68. The Mississippi challengers were seated in 68. And now she's speaking up for the Alabama challengers who uh, ultimately lose. And I'm just going to put in a quick plug for this new book, uh, Until I'm Free by Keisha Blaine, who is now a professor at Brown University, that speaks to the importance of Fannie Lou Hamer as an historical figure. And as the subtitle puts it, her enduring message to America. I want to highly encourage that one uh, for you to pick that up. Um, and, and finally, uh, uh, there's another issue that they didn't cover very well at the convention, which was the, uh, Reverend Channing Phillips was the first National Party black nominee for president. It was a symbolic nomination. Uh, no one, you know, everyone knew that he wasn't going to win. He wasn't a contender. But um, it is uh, quite uh, interesting that this is the first time this happened at a convention uh, in 1968. So a name that has, has sort of largely been uh, lost to history, I think. And I'll just show you one last image from inside the convention hall. Uh, this is uh, Eddie Anderson, a young delegate from California. Um, as things come to a head with the uh, bond uh, uh, Julian Bond challenge against the Georgia delegation. Uh, things just sort of spiral out of control in the convention hall. It's 2.45 in the morning, and they have business plan to keep them going till at least 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> 
Um, but the hall just erupts in, in anger around what's been happening around the Georgia delegation. And then uh, this fellow, Andy, Eddie Anderson, sets his credentials on fire. Or he tries to. They're not really very flammable. It's a symbolic gesture. And the news rushes over because, of course, it's this, well, this is amazing. Like, visually, it's quite a story, this guy with the dashiki and the beads, and he's, he's burning the card. And this is sort of the straw that breaks the camel's back, finally. It's over. And they adjourn early and then pick up again the next day. Okay, so that's just a handful of images from inside, so that we're not only thinking about what the, ju the you know, issues of social justice and brutality and so on are in the streets, but also what was happening in the convention ha hall itself. Um, let's turn to the aftermath. There's an immediate aftermath of people's anger at the networks, as I've already said. Letters running to CBS are 11 to 1 against the network. Uh, in terms of media responses, uh, the local Chicago media fights back. They create a new publication called Chicago Journalism Review, which is sort of the uh, Chicago version of Columbia Journalism Review, if you've heard of that. Uh, a publication that is about news uh, by professional news people, but with a, with a strong critical edge. How can we be critical of news that our, our colleagues, our peers are producing? Um, another immediate reaction on the media front is uh, a number of films produced by an upstart film group in Chicago called Film Group. <laughs> um, and I'm going to show you a four-minute clip and then head into my final, final comments uh, from a film called American Revolution II, Battle of Chicago, which they released in 1969. Um, and I will just note that there is some profanity in this clip. And um, I will also note there's a, a cutaway. There's two cutaways that might uh, be hard to understand if you don't have all the context. One is uh, they, ha they have some white folks from Appalachia who are in the film because one of the film group's objectives was to get black people of Chicago and Appalachian transport to Chicago to talk about their common cause around labor issues and suppression by Mayor Daley. And you'll also see a shot of Mayor Daley when he is talking about his shoot to kill and shoot to maim order that he uh, put out during the Chicago uprising after the, the death of Dr. King. So just a little context to help that make more sense for you. See, um, black people have been demonstrating and going on for I don't know how long. and. Um, you know, we've been getting our heads beat and whatnot. We knew what was going to happen when those folks went down there because we have seen the pigs on the scene. We know what he's like. We know what he's capable of, just being a damn pig, oinking and beating and walking the streets. I'm sick of these damn pigs walking our streets. And so everybody gets uptight when a few hunkies get their heads beat. What did they do when we was getting our heads beat? So I don't even want to deal with why they got their heads beat, no damn walker reporting up, what other, whatever else that's going on. I just want to deal with black and black liberation. My scene is picking up my damn gun, and I'm a mother. Have my baby in one hand, my gun in the other, and walking up to some hunky, all hunkies, saying, I'm here, motherfucker, to get what's mine. Right on. But, you know, like all over the city of Chicago, each person, like black power is doing its own thing, and another is Irish power, whatever you want to call it, you know, we're all people and all poor folks. And like the Democratic Convention, you know, and they're uh, shortening their belly sticks and that, and they seen, you know, they didn't care what kind of person you was. They worked on you with that thing. We realized a whole lot of stuff, like Dully, and all we realized we in the same boat. How it flows from the barrel of a gun. At all, at all. Uh, did you feel that something had to be done about Dully before the Democratic Convention? That's right, man, that's right. He put out that shoot, when he put out that shoot to kill, man, the man that just not got power, man. He just didn't sit up there and got so much power, man, until um, he worse than Hitler. I said to him very emphatically and very definitely that an order be issued immediately under his signature to shoot to kill any arsonist. Sure, everybody get a gun and go down the street and every dark one you see, shoot, you know what I mean? They're all evil, but uh, after it kind of calmed down and everything else, why... There was a different story to him. To shoot, to maim, or cripple anyone looting any stores in our city. Isn't he, after all, the man who coined the phrase, good government is good politics? He does he believe, believe it. it. And he thinks good government includes the suppression of, uh, of uh, leftist dissent. Well, they did it now. When they had this convention, about three years ago, you know, when they put out that uh, shoot to kill order, you know what I'm saying? 
So his colleagues come up there and told him, say, look here, man, you got to modify this thing. So he goes and modify it, but still mean the same thing. So when they had this convention, they said, this is my city, and y'all can't do what y'all gonna do. So he figured that these black brothers is gonna start some of these things. So he gets these boys all hyped up, you understand? You know, like you know, when you're playing football or something like that, you know how the coach keep coaching and telling you, say, well, look at that, we got to do this and we got to do that. So naturally, Jack, when uh, this convention comes, these hippies and hippies come, but there ain't no black folks, they don't care who they're there. They gonna whoop somebody, they got to whoop somebody, you know? You said the police was there. The police, all this uh, military force was there for the black people there, huh? That's right, man. But uh, we, 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 we was cool. We, we laid dead. We gonna dig and see what happened. But yet still, the police, they got to whoop somebody because cause they fired up. They just got to whoop somebody. They don't care who they whoop. And like when the white folks dig, they said, they said, look here, baby. No, they tell this, look here, baby. He done fucked up because you whooping my kid. But uh, now, nah, you whooping them black folks, it's a shame. I don't want to, we wouldn't like to see you do it. But you you done fucked up now, Dan, because you don't whoop Don, you don't whoop my kids, baby. That's my man. He has stood as lawyers, doctors, and so on and so forth. And uh, these, 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 these middle class, bourgeois folks, they going to college, they got dope. They folks got dope. Uh, people like us, that, we ain't got no dope. If we go to college, we got to go on, you know, an athletic, athletic scholarship and so on and so forth. So uh, what they do that? They said, well, dude, this is my time to do that. He blocks off a whole neighborhood now. And if people live there, they can't raise their windows. It's hot. They can't raise their windows now. What kind of shit is that? Huh? You know this, man, don't you? I just want to see that, how far, you know, the, your idea. Yeah, well, I know what you're saying, man. Sure that uh, you may not have been able to see the watermark, but this is from Chicago Film Archives, um, and this material is online, so you could watch all the productions of Chicago Film Group uh, on your own, and I, I highly encourage it. Um, even this small little clip there's, is so resonant. There's so many interesting things happening. You've got this one young woman who is just like, I don't care about the convention. It's irrelevant to me. I care about black power and black people. And then you have another fellow who says, uh, it, you know, at the end that he notes that this is white on white violence. You know, th he notes that like the bourgeois doctors and lawyers and so on are seeing their own children being beat, uh, and and you know how impactful this was. And also he notes that like black people were sort of out of this. There were there were black protesters in Chicago, but very few. It's a very small number. It was very very much a white event, and a lot of uh, the local blacks either sort of hid out or left town because if you were known as an agitator or a troublemaker, Daly was likely to arrest you before the convention happened just to come to your house and and have his, his police take you away so a lot of people if they could they left town okay so these are the sorts of perspectives um, that you know we're sorely lacking from TV news coverage of events and you know they show what the what image making in the hands of the people rather than sanctioned corporate media maker, makers can produce a much wider range of, of perspectives just to quickly finish up here, um, I already said that you know one of the aftermaths of this was Nixon uh, uh, getting elected, and he basically weaponized the idea of liberal media bias, and that idea became nationalized and normalized. It was no longer necessarily a, a right-wing or fringe kind of position as it had been before the convention. In the long term, is this the beginning of a crisis that culminates in Trump's fake news accusation? Well. Not exactly, right? That's thin history, and you don't want to just draw a straight line, uh, but maybe you draw a more of a dotted line between these events. And we can guardedly see this as a tipping point moment. Um, the idea of bias got traction, it grew, so it's a seed that took root. It found roots in right-wing fundraising and as an element of the culture wars, which is uh, obviously still an issue today. Um, Interestingly, you know, 50 years later, the Walker Report's conclusions are widely accepted. The notion that what we saw was actually a police riot is widely believed, but there's uh, no cultural memory of the dominant notion in 1968 that TV news had gotten the story wrong. Um, the idea that the news media is inherently liberal, though, has stuck as a rhetorical weapon of the right. Today, we hold cameras and telephones in our pockets. Gathering of images of police brutality is no longer wholly dependent on the largesse of media institutions. So what difference does or should that make? That is exactly what we are here to discuss today and tomorrow. Thank you. I will stop there. And uh, we do have a few minutes for discussion, questions. We have like 10 minutes. So I would love to hear from you. If you have a question, please come up to the mic on the side. And there's one here too. Hello, Professor Hendershot, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Sharice Lepree, 
MIT alum and uh, professor at Syracuse. And I was actually just having a thought the other day. I was really taken by the distinction between the shot being short-sighted, not showing the broad thing versus what's in the shot is fake. And one of the things that I've been really thinking about is when we watch the footage, the young woman who shot the footage of George Floyd's last moments, we see other people holding cameras. But that other footage has not had the same traction. Uh, and so I'm now starting to think, well, where is that footage? Is it just living on people's cameras? Did it never get shared after uh, her name became public and she became a f public figure? I wouldn't want to, like, good on her, thank you. I wouldn't want to be that. So uh, it's just, just the thought that I think, I, I would love to hear your perspective on when we know that there's other footage, but that has not been the footage. Yeah. Thank you. That's, an, it, that, that's a good question, it, thank you. Um, I will say that uh, around any major news event or news that becomes a major news, you know, things that happen that become major events, uh, news agencies are looking for every single person who had a camera there and reaching out, whether it's through social media, emailing people, whatever they can do to, to collect that footage. So it's, it's impossible to me to think that uh, all those other cameras, people holding all those other cameras weren't contacted by network news, by journalists and so on, by uh, online news aggregators, whoever. Um, so the footage surely has been seen and I wonder if the footage that has become the footage, right, that we take as the iconic footage is simply, and it, it's horrible to say, like the best shot, the best vantage point that showed the most. You know, is that why it is the uh, winning footage, I hate to use that word, but that has become the footage of that moment? And my guess is that is probably correct. Um, and that other pieces of footage were, uh, were also acquired, you know, for legal use but have not trended in media uh, in, and been reproduced so much um, because they were from a different angle, they were from the wrong angle, that kind of thing. That is my um, instinct on this. I would also suspect that, and this is what's gonna feel you know, different from 68 for sure, is that the conspiracy theories around these other images are probably abundant somewhere that someone's saying, well, if you look at that guy on the left, he sees what's really happening, which is not a murder at all, this kind of thing. But we haven't seen the footage, so we don't know. And it's just, it's like the Zapruder footage and the grassy knoll kind of stuff of like, oh, if we could just see the other images, we'd see something different. Um, so uh, I, I'm sure there's some fomenting around those other images too. Um, but thank you for, for, for asking about that. I think it's a really uh, important question. Yeah. Hi, along that lines, I was wondering if you could talk about the process of the mythologizing of specific images. You talked about how there are really some images that have really become part of this mythology and you've done a lot of work to yeah. find those images that were kind of ignored. So what made an image one to be mythologized, and what made one that was potentially equally powerful to be forgotten? Forgotten, yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, uh, the question was about you know what makes certain images mythologized from this moment and others not, and the Battle of Michigan Avenue, so called, right on Wednesday night, that is 17 minutes of police beating people, in which the networks ran in full. Hard to imagine now in a short attention called span culture of you know 10 second news clips, right? Um, that's the footage that gained the most traction because it was most widely seen initially. That's part of why it gained traction. Um, there's two kinds of footage there. One is the overhead. This was actually a spot where there were electrical cables right in front of the hotel. And so there are TV cameras on top of trucks, but they're not transmitting live, but they're capturing images that are bringing back the convention hall for Walter Cronkite to you know, put on the air. And those images from on top of the trucks are high angle and kind of far away. And then the local affiliate of CBS comes in with 16 millimeter cameras and they're on the ground. And so they get a more uh, personal approach because you can see people's faces as it's happening. And uh, NBC didn't have those people on the ground. So CBS had better footage because you could actually see people and identify people and so on. And CBS probably repeated that footage on the ground quite a bit because it was very, very good footage. And then that way contributed to the dissemination. And as I said, they went viral using contemporary language, but could contributed to that vast spread, right, of these images. Um, 
And then you have, you know, these, these, a handful of still images. I'm sure a lot of people took still images, especially journalists, but their cameras were destroyed so often that a lot of that stuff um, uh, didn't come out. So in a way, part of the issue is a sort of paucity of images because so many were destroyed, so you focus on the ones that you have. Um, and the next stage of answering that question would be to like go to the producers of WGBH television, uh, like Vietnam and television history from, I think it was 1984, um, where this is one of the first places I saw this imagery in, uh, you know, a few years after this, this famous documentary series came out. They had one episode called the Homefront USA. And it was a key moment in 84 of mythologizing the 60s and what protest was, and a handful of images, and these Chicago images were right there. And then I started noticing, as I watched more documentaries made after that, up to, say, the Ken Burns Vietnam series that came out a year or two ago, um, I keep seeing the same street images. And I don't know if it's because WGBH selected these in the early 80s, but that could be part of it, you know. Um, that, I mean, I've seen these images on Colbert. You know, where he's doing a parody, he did a parody of, about um, the former president where he's comparing it to, like, ni he's comparing now to 1968, and he cuts back and forth with imagery, and he shows BLM imagery, and then he shows Chicago 68, you know? And they're the same, some of the same images that I just showed you. Um, so they kept being recycled, and it becomes a sort of anomalous when you see an image you hadn't seen before. You're like, oh, this, well, this one, how did this get in here? And one example of that is some very, uh, on the second day, so before the Battle of Michigan Avenue, um, there had been quite a bit of tear gassing in the street, and uh, about 1.30 in the morning, Walter Cronkite gets his hand on some 16 millimeter footage of a woman trying to drive a sort of middle class, a middle-aged woman in, a, in a, like a station wagon trying to drive some kids away who've been tear gassed and the National Guard stops her and they put a grenade launcher in her car through the window, a grenade launcher, at, you know, like at her head. Um, and she's saying like, why can't I just leave with, you know, what's, what's going on? And there's no voiceover because it's like, so, it's news like done, uh, so it's so quick and dirty kind of news. Like they got the footage, they put it together, and Cronkite only interjects once. He just says, uh, that's a grenade launcher, just, just to emphasize. And then at the end he says, um, well, I don't think any commentary needs to be made. You, you've all seen it. Good night. Like he ends with that. <laughs> and you would think that that imagery would have become iconic. Um, and it has eventually, later, you know, like it, over the past few years I've seen it in some documentaries, but it sort of disappeared for 48 years. Um, so uh, I'm not sure, I haven't really answered your question. I've just said, correct. <laughs> Things don't get mythologized in, you know, how does it happen? I don't know. Um, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of, at least a sense of like how I try to tell the story and, and kind of like a detective follow the leads and figure out what got traction where. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, it's so unlike me to ask a technology question, but what resonated with me the most about your talk was this moment where the police were drawn to the light in order to put it out. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, so I feel like there's a lot to be said here in the relationship between bearing witness and shedding literal light, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if much was made about that fact in 1968, right? That is to say, you know, here is this like literal technological moment of shedding light and uh, police brutality looked like wanting to suppress that truth telling in by any means necessary. Um, it's a great question. I mean, really, when people, when the news reported on the destruction of equipment, like lights, cameras, lenses, um, they tended to say how much they cost. Um, not in a metaphorical way, <laughs> in a literal way of like, well, that was a $300 lens, you know, what? Um, and there's not a lot of talk of it 
uh, among media people because of their own reluctance to be the story. They wanted to tell the story, they didn't want to be the story. And that's part of the undercovering of violence, I think, in Chicago, is a concern like, it's not about us. We don't understand why police are beating us because we haven't had this problem uh, all the time in the past. But if we report that, who cares about us? It's about the political event. You know, we're a neutral party here to record it. So getting into issues like the discretion of the light would be uh, too self-serving, would be the sort of professional norms that would dictate talking about this or not talking about it. Um, I will back up, though, and say that this attack on, on journalists was more common at certain moments in the Deep South during the, the battles over um, desegregation and at Ole Miss when there was a, a white riot about uh, integration. Um, Dan Rather is out with uh, a, a news uh, a, a cameraman. He's working the sound, the cameraman is working the camera. They have one light and they had a system where they would turn on the light count to 15 and then turn it off um, and run while they were shoot, you know, stop enough that you could, had to to film, but then run. And so they were using these short spurts so that the light wouldn't be destroyed. And then at a certain point, they, part of their problem was what, one of the dictums of, of shooting these kinds of, of situations was you should go bloody and go high go for the, the bloodiest images, the images of confrontation, and get as high up as you can so that you're safe from it. And that's that CBS footage I was referencing for the last question of like on top of the news trucks. And in Ole Miss, they couldn't find a high spot. So they were running along the ground. They would, between the, those 15 seconds, they would lie on the ground because they were being shot at and so on. Um, and that's the only time I've heard someone actually like talk about the light in a real, and this is in one of his memoirs, in a really kind of dramatic, uh, technical way that obviously has resonance beyond the beyond the technical. All right, I have a couple from online. Great. Um, first is more of just a, a comment. It said, "Wow, this is powerful." Uh, and then the second one, great presentation. What do we make of violence against the media or those bearing witness? How does this? How does that impact future coverage and memory? Wow, well, it impacts future coverage and memory because if you can't cover it, then you know, how do you create memory? Well, to, to a large extent through images and through collecting audio, and then you have people who are there, and if they haven't collected the images or the audio, then the memory is just inside these physical bodies and they have to tell it back to you. And then someone, a filmmaker comes in and does an interview with them, and ah, now we have the audio because someone tells their memory uh, of what happened. Right, so um, it becomes a sort of convoluted, rolling kind of process. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop with the, there with that question. Any other questions? Oh, here's one. Great. Is that Chris? Hey, hey man. I'm good. How are you? Good seeing you, Heather. Thanks so much. Nice to see you. Um, so it's kind of a film nerdy question. I couldn't help but think of um, Medium Cool coming mm -hmm. out right, roughly around this time. So I'm wondering how you situate that in relationship to what you're saying about the news, of how much is it challenging that imagery? How much is it sort of countering it itself? Like what impact did that have in relationship to the TV news that you yep. are speaking of? Medium Cool is a film by Haskell Wexler, who was famous as a director of photography as a cinematographer, and then he made this film about Chicago. It's called Medium Cool as a take on Marshall McLuhan, who had the idea of, you know, cool media versus hot media. And TV, he thought was cool, not funky cool, <laughs> but cool versus hot, you know, like, a, like anyway. It, don't get me going about Marshall McLuhan. <laughs> I disagree with him about many things. Um, but so he titled his film this way, and then he goes to Chicago during, while things are happening, right? And it's scripted, it's a mix of scripted material starring Robert Forster, um, who you may remember from Better Call Saul and uh, Breaking Bad. Uh, uh, as a young man, he's in this movie shot in 68 that comes out in 69, and it's a mix of documentary footage of the time and then uh, you know, scripted material, and, and Forster gets involved with someone from Appalachia, which speaks exactly to these images from the Chicago, uh, from film group, you know, where they're very interested in this as a political issue in Chicago. Um, and along with that network 
news footage, uh, those images from, from medium cool become part of the historical record um, and part of that assembly of images we have, that, but uh, unofficial. In other words, I, point, I, I emphasize the kind of top-down news production, but here we have an independent filmmaker who happened to be in town and managed to take uh, images. Um, I would encourage you to check it out if you're interested in this topic. That said, it's not 90% images in the street. It's maybe 10 to 20% images on the street, and it ends with um, the crises in the street and with tear gas and with shots of the news vans going by with the cameras stuck on top. And so you do get some of that documentary footage, um, but it's not exclusively that kind of footage. More broadly, the film is a critique of uh, TV news just exactly for what I just said, that uh, go bloody and go high, <laughs> a critique of the go bloody part of that, a critique of the unfeelingness of being an objective, neutral recorder, okay? So on the one hand, w one might celebrate neutrality in news gathering, that you, you don't gather news just to make an argument for or against something, but this film is arguing, like, how can we be neutral when we're dealing with fascism, authoritarianism, Vietnam, These, this is not a time for news gatherers to be neutral. And so I think that is um, a key contribution that Medium Cool makes to this part of the discussion. So check out the Criterion disc. <laughs> Any um, other actually, questions? I actually have a lot. Okay, great. It's a comment, it's more of a, it's a question and a comment. Um, so what I, uh, like what stands out a lot about this, um, and I guess what I like about it, and not that there's a lot to like about the the violence, but um, I, it makes me think about um, how you know Martin Luther King wanted the protests to be captured mm -hmm. on the media so yep. that people can see all this racism and get to see um, like let's see like let people know what's happening to us, what's happening to black people. And what I like about what you've done is the extent to which you've highlighted um, the violence against the media also, because I don't think that it, well, I know, I mean, and from, from my being a teacher, from my being a student, that that just wasn't talked about as much as it's like the violence against um, black people. And it, it makes me wonder though, because the media is in charge, if any of that like was to, um, like how, it makes me think about how much it contributed to racism in the sense of it's like, all right, there's white people that are, like there's a story out there about these white people that are already being racist against black people mm -hmm. and we don't want to make it seem like that white people were harmful to other white people. Like let's not make it seem like white people were those, you know, at, at that time were just like that cruel and that bad. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on why a lot of this violence against the media story just wasn't told as much. And I appreciate you bringing it to light. Thank you. Um, I mean, it wasn't told as much because the media wanted to de-emphasize it. Again, that idea, we don't want to be the story, we want to uh, tell the story. And uh, following the convention with so many attacks on them, the, I mean, just from a sort of public relations standpoint, the last thing that people wanted to do was say like, well, we were beaten up, look how Dan Rather was beaten. Uh, and so that was really underplayed, underplayed, and Dan Rather, it was sort of a, you know, kind of a macho kind of like, well, it's all a day's work, Walter, it's all fine. You know, everyone kind of underplayed it because that was like the professional norm, but it was also something that really uh, was amplified after, it, after the attacks. And uh, a great example of that, uh, not telling that story, is that in TV Guide, and I'm gonna say maybe six months, I may not be remembering right, but the head of NBC News, Ruben Frank, wrote a piece for TV Guide about the convention. And TV Guide at that point had the highest distribution of any magazine in America, right? If you wanted to hit the biggest number of people in a magazine, it was either TV Guide or Reader's Digest. And TV Guide had more, just a little more than Reader's Digest. And Ruben Frank, had already cataloged all the news coverage and found, okay, we did 3% uh, of street violence and 97% in the convention hall, whereas uh, CBS did more like 5% in 95, okay? So he puts out those numbers. And he basically said, don't blame the messenger. We showed you this little piece of what we saw and it's what we saw, you know? And you know, so he's sort of just fighting for the objective reality <laughs> of these images. And he deliberately does not mention anything about 
the attacks on the news and in you know internal memos he says like I just told the story this way you know and he got praise from uh, Robert Sarnoff and all you know the all the big wigs over him were like yes this is perfect thank you you went to the mainstream venue and you didn't make us look whiny and you didn't make it look like we were saying we were the victims you just stood up for journalistic integrity and that is uh, journalist integrity is a real thing, but it's also a mythologized thing. It's also about professional norms and, and, the, and the ethics of, prof of, of professionals. But that's how that uh, violence against the media got uh, de-escalated. And you really didn't, I mean, during uh, civil rights crises, when journalists were under attack, like Dan Rather and at Ole Miss, like I was just saying, like they didn't talk about that then. It was something that would come out five or 10 years later in a memoir. That's when you're allowed to tell your personal story. You're writing as a, an important figure, telling your memoir, not as a newsman. You know, you wouldn't go on TV and say, this is a terrible thing that happened to me at Ole Miss. You save it for your memoir. Yeah. Thanks. Sure, thank you. Hmm? Anyone? Okay, I think that is the last for our questions. Um, please join me in thanking Professor Hendershot for her talk. Thank you all.